Well, we're going to continue our series we've been in called Sizzlin' Summer, and it's been an awesome series so far. We get to hear from other communicators from around the area, but also we get to bring messages that usually we're in a series and we're on a topic, and this one we just get to pray about a message and just bring that single message to the house, and so I've done exactly that, and I am so excited to bring you this message. I got to warn you, I have like 40 points, so the more amens you give me, the faster I'll go today, but it's going to be an awesome message, but before we jump into it, I do want to look on the other side of that screen and say a huge hello to the men and women that are joining us at our CCNO jail campus or maybe one of the prisons or Belize Central Prison or online. Welcome. We believe in you. We're proud of you. We love you. Belize Central Prison, Pastor Kyle and I will be there to see you in just a few weeks. We can't wait to be with you. But this morning, sizzling summer, I want to share the message and I want to set this message up in Matthew chapter 4. Quite possibly, this could be one of the most important things that you learn as a believer and that I have learned over the years in studying scripture. And I wanna share it with you. Matthew chapter four, verses 18 through 19, they say this. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me and I will make you what? Don't finish it yet. Maybe you know the verse. But if you didn't, I just wonder what would you think Jesus would say there? We got to know it's the most important thing to Jesus because he's just called his first two disciples. And he says to them, follow me and I'm going to make you into something. We got to know it's got to be important. It's got to be an important thing that he's about to make them He starts the gospels with it. And if you keep reading, he ends the gospels with this command. And then he starts the book of Acts with it and then ends the New Testament with it. So this is something really important to Jesus. Follow me and I will make you. As I think about that, I would maybe think Jesus would say, follow me and I'll make you holy. Follow me and I'll make you righteous. Follow me and I'll make you a better person. Follow me and I'll make you a deep spiritual Christian. Follow me and I'll make you a better worshiper. Follow me and I'll make you a better husband or a better wife or a better leader or a better teacher or a better parent. Follow me and I will make you what? Here's what he says. I wanna show it to you because it matters deeply to Jesus. And he said this, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, Jesus cares that we are fishers of men. The first thing he wanted to teach people that started following him was how to catch other people, to be fishers of people, to be someone that shares their faith with someone else so they too can have an encounter with Jesus. That's what mattered most to Jesus. And so the title of the message today is this, Followers Fish. Followers fish. You know, in the Brownlee household, it's rare that we have something that all of us like to do. The one thing that we actually have in the Brownlee household that we all like to do, all of us, all the kids, me and Kyle, is to fish. We love to go fishing. And so I want you to know there's, there is a little bit of competition that runs in our blood. If you are a Brownlee, you are competing with one another. That's just how it works in our household. And there is a bit of a debate going on between me and my teenage son that I would like your help in settling today. And that is, who's the better fisherman? Him or me? Him or mom? And I feel like I just want to show you a picture and we are going to settle this today on who the better fisherman is. And so take a look at this picture. And so clear, it is so clear. I want you to see my son Jay sees caught this tiny little largemouth bass, I think is what this fish is called. But then you see on the other side what I caught. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, Jace caught the bigger fish. He's the better fisherman. But I want you to think about something for just a minute. How easy is it to get a tiny little hook in that big old mouth? Now, somebody with skill, it would take an expert fisherman, woman, to be able to get a large hook in that tiny little mouth of that fish. So I think it's pretty clear who the expert fisherman is. Let me tell you how small this fish is that I caught. It was so small that as I cast, I was reeling in, I did not know anything was on the line, and I reeled it in only to just in my head think it was just my bait and cast it back out again. I did that 
three more times till it dawned on me I was fishing with shrimp. <laughs> that was shrimp was my bait. And I go, oh, I've caught a fish. And so I reeled it back in. And so I feel like we've settled the debate today. Clearly, I am the better fisherman. Now, let me tell you a fishing joke that I heard. There were two men that were out fishing and their names were Frank and Bob. And they went fishing often together. And this one particular day, they were out fishing. And as they were fishing, a funeral service, a procession began to go over the bridge that they were fishing under. Now, as this, this funeral begins to pass over the bridge, Bob stops fishing. He takes off his hat, he puts it over his heart, and he stands at attention until the entire funeral service procession completely passed by. And his friend Frank looks at him and says, gee, Bob, I didn't know you had it in you. And Bob replied back, it was the least I could do. I mean, I was married to her for 30 years. <laughs> Followers fish, followers fish. And so as I thought about that, because Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. It's important to him. He came to seek and save the lost. It's why he came. Followers fish. As I thought about that, I had to wrestle with one question. And I am asking you to wrestle with it too. And the question is this, if I'm not fishing, am I really following Jesus? because followers fish. If I know Jesus, there's one mandate on my life and that is to tell others about him because followers fish. And if I'm not fishing, am I really following Jesus? But you're not the only one if you struggle with that today. I've struggled with that too throughout my life. And I, I, I wanna answer, why don't we fish? So why don't we share our faith? Why don't we feel comfortable telling others about the good news of Jesus? And I came up with just a few reasons that I've struggled with over the years. I wonder if you have too. Here's a few of them. Here's one, maybe we think people aren't open. Have you ever been to the place and you think about somebody and you go ahead and make the judgment call? There's no way they would be open and receptive to hearing about Jesus. Maybe they're, they are too far gone. They are so far gone that there is no coming back. They would never wanna hear the message of Jesus in their life. Maybe they are too addicted. Maybe, maybe, they've just, maybe they're a part of another religion. It would be too hard to break down those walls. And we come to the conclusion they are not open. Or maybe we think they are too successful. Their life's going good. They have everything they need. They're really su seemingly successful. There's no way they would be open to a message of hope that they need Jesus too. And we just come to the conclusion that people aren't open, but Jesus would not agree with that conclusion. Let me show you what Jesus said in John chapter four, verses 35 through 36. Jesus says this, do you not say four more months and then the harvest? And he's talking, right now he's using a farming analogy, but it's just like our fishing analogy. He's saying, don't you, see four, don't you say four more months and then the harvest? But I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ready now. Jesus is saying, don't say people aren't open. They are open. I've already prepared their hearts. See, you and I can't see what's going on in a heart. So be really careful about looking at the exterior of someone's life and declaring that they are not open and they are not ready for the good news of the gospel. And Jesus tells us that even now the reaper is ready to go harvest. In fact, Jesus goes on to say, it's not the harvest. It's not the amount of, that the fish aren't biting. It's that you're not casting a line. It's not that the harvest isn't ready, it's that no reapers are going out into the harvest field and bringing in the loss, bringing in the harvest. And so we need to be careful about this one because people are ready to hear the good news of the gospel. Or maybe this is one for you. We just don't feel bold enough. Have you ever felt like, I don't know enough scriptures? <laughs> I could not debate somebody. I, I couldn't present an, a, a, an argument of why God did this or did that. I don't know enough. I'm not bold enough. Maybe you're thinking, I'm an introvert. I'm not an extrovert. I'm not one to just talk to people. I don't even wanna talk to people. I come into church late and I leave early. I don't wanna talk. We know who you are because we take video of you in and out the door. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But we think, I'm not bold enough. I don't know enough. I'm not equipped enough. I'm not ready enough. I wanna show you this verse, Acts chapter one, verse eight. Jesus tells his disciples this. 
He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You will represent me. You will go fishing and you will be successful. Jesus is basically telling us, it's not the messenger that holds the power, it's the message. And every time you and I have a message that holds the power and it doesn't matter if I feel bold enough, if I know enough, if I present it eloquently enough, none of that matters because God will supernaturally enable me in the right moment to be able to say the right thing to the right person so that they too can have an encounter with Jesus. So this one, Jesus is very clear on this that he will, he will equip us for what we need. I was thinking about this, another fishing story in our family. There was a time that I, we all went out fishing and the older kids and, and Kyle were off fishing and Brax and I were fishing together. And we're sitting on the rocks and we're, we're fishing and I, we're, he's getting very impatient because it is taking me too long to rip the worm in, into and put it on the hook and all the gross stuff. I, do, I know I'm in pink, but I'm not too girly to put a worm on a hook, okay? So I'm helping him, but I was not doing it fast enough for him. And he was just annoyed and frustrated. And so while I'm still trying to get the worms all together, he just starts catching casting his line out with just the hook. And I look at my son and I say, Braxton, that will never work. You have to, everyone, every good fisherman knows you have to have bait on the hook to actually catch a fish. You don't have any bait. You're not gonna be able to just cast out a hook. And about that time, his pole does the little bend, like when you catch a fish. And he's like, I got one, I told you. And he starts to reel it in and sure enough, he caught a fish. And about that time, I, as I'm taking the fish off, I explained to him, well, that was a coincidence. That won't ever happen again. You can't fish with no worm. You gotta be patient and let let me put the right bait on the hook. You gotta have the right bait and the sun's gotta be in the right place and you gotta put it in the right spot of the water and you gotta make sure you're just the right noise level or you're not gonna be able to catch these fish. And at this time, as I'm giving the speech, he's already cast it back out and sure enough, he's reeling in another fish. And that boy went on to cast a baitless hook out six more times and caught eight fish right in that moment. And it was in that moment God taught me a lesson. And God said to me, I'm the one that puts the fish on the hook. I don't need you to have the right bait. I don't need you to have the right temperature. I don't need you to have the right sunlight. I just need you to cast the line. I just need you to throw the hook out. I just need you to go fishing and I'll put the fish on the hook. And I learned in that moment, it doesn't matter if I'm bold enough or I say the right things, it's God who's actually doing the fishing. I just have to cast the line. I was thinking about not just boldness, but maybe it, within that boldness, part of it is that you just feel embarrassed. Have you ever felt embarrassed? I, I know we wouldn't wanna admit this, but I felt like that. Embarrassed to tell my friends that I follow Jesus or embarrassed to, to maybe ask them if they would like to follow Jesus. And I just wanna read this verse to you because I think it takes care of that. Romans chapter one, verse 16 says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it has the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. In other words, you've got good news. There is nothing to be embarrassed about. There's nothing to be ashamed about. We have the good news of the gospel. We have a good message. I have to make you think, I was thinking, if I had the cure to cancer and I knew somebody with cancer, wouldn't I go shouting it from the rooftop to them? Wouldn't I want them to know I have the cure? I know what you need. You and I have the cure to eternal damnation in hell. We have the eternal life, good news story. You and I don't have to be ashamed of the gospel for it, it, it holds in it the power to rescue every man and woman. It's good news today that we have. And so we don't have to be embarrassed and we don't have to be bold enough. And here's another one that I wonder if we wrestle with. We don't feel responsible for sharing. In other words, we just feel like someone else will do it. Someone else will tell them. Think of your family members, your coworkers and your friends. Someone else can tell them the good news of the gospel. Well, let me read this verse. I wanna read to you Romans chapter 10. I'm gonna read verses 13 through 14. But before I do, would you get a picture in your mind of someone you know that does not yet know Jesus? Now, maybe you're sitting in this room and it's you and you don't know Jesus yet. I, I want you to know there's coming a moment at the end of this service and I'm gonna offer a prayer for you and your life's gonna be different to, 
forever today if you say yes to Jesus. But if you're in the room and you know Jesus, think of somebody you know that does not. And I want you to get their name and face in your mind and let me read this verse. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 14. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter how far gone they are, how addicted they are, how messed up you think they are, how resistant you think they are, how hard-hearted you think they are, how, how just the, the resistance that you feel, that none of that matters. God says, no one is beyond my reach. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless you tell them? How will they know? My point is we all have a responsibility in sharing Jesus with others. You and I could be the last source of the message to them. Nobody's promised tomorrow, not even us. And if we know somebody in our world that doesn't know Jesus yet, how will they believe if they don't hear? And how will they hear if we don't tell them? We all have the responsibility to share Jesus and share our faith with those around us. Here's the final one that maybe we wrestle with today, and it's this. We just don't know how. We just don't know How? What do I do? What do I say? How do I do this? And so I wanna spend the rest of our time together and I wanna share with you, how do we fish? Because Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men and followers fish, so how do we fish? I wanna show you seven different approaches today. And the reason I wanna show you these is because I think sometimes it hinders us from sharing because we think there's only one right way to do it and it's a one size fits all. And if it doesn't fit us, we just don't do it. Anybody else? Like I'm not comfortable with that. That is not my personality. And so I won't do it at all because I thought there was only one right way. I'm about to show you there were multiple ways all through scripture. And it's not an exhaustive list I wanna give you today, but I wanna show you seven different approaches. I was thinking about fishing poles and if you think about fishing, for example, if somebody handed me a, f- a fly f- for to go fly fishing, a fly fish rod, I would have zero clue on how to use that thing. I would not know how to cast it. I wouldn't know all the things that go with it. I wouldn't even know where to start. I wouldn't be comfortable. So I would not go fishing because I would not know what to do. But if somebody handed me one of those poles with the little push buttons and the little spinny thing, and especially if it was pink, I'm in, and a big bobber on it, I'm your girl. I can fish with that. I know how to use that pole. And the same is true in these approaches I wanna show you. God's gonna show you an approach that will work for you. All of us are responsible, and so let's ask God to show us seven approaches that we find in scripture to go fishing. Here's the first one, number one, it's this. There was Peter's direct approach. Peter's direct approach. Now this approach is about being just what it says, very direct with it. Well, this is where I'm directly asking somebody, do you know Jesus? If not, why not? And here's how you can know Jesus. It's a direct approach. I'm sharing the actual message of Jesus with someone else. It's a direct approach. This one we get from Acts chapter two. And what's happening in Acts chapter two is all of the disciples are in the upper room waiting for what Jesus said was gonna come, which was the Holy Spirit. They all get filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible goes on to tell us they all begin to speak in other languages. Now, all the believers were together, but there were unbelievers all watching all this happen. And as they begin to speak in other languages, the unbelievers began to say, what in the world is happening? They must be drunk, is what they said. And Peter, in this moment, stands up and preaches a direct sermon about the message of Christ. And he says to these people, we are not drunk as you say. Let me tell you what's happening right now. Let me tell you about the Messiah that suffered and died. And he begins to give this direct message. And then look what happens. Acts chapter two, verses 37 through 38. It says this, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, 
What should we do? And Peter replies, here's what you do. They're asking, how do we follow too? Because this message has touched us. And then he says this, each of you must repent for your sins, turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's very direct in his approach. And do you know what happens? The Bible tells us 3,000 people in that moment gave their lives to Jesus. They became followers, 3,000 people because of a direct approach. In fact, one thing you can count on is every single Sunday, there's gonna be a direct approach from this platform, no matter who's preaching. No matter what's happening in a Sunday service, we are going to give an opportunity for those that do not know Jesus to have an encounter with him, repent from their sin, turn to God, be water baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and their life changed forever. Every single weekend, you can count on it. There's gonna be a direct approach. And it's effective. And you might be the one, you might have the gift of evangelism on you. There's a spiritual gifts that God gives us. And some of you are anointed to talk to strangers. You're anointed to go on mission trips. You're anointed to talk to your coworkers very directly. And God is gonna give you success in that. But not all of you are gonna feel like that. So let me give you some more approaches. Here's a second one and it's this, number two, Paul's persuasive approach we find in scripture. Now, a persuasive approach is we're gonna watch as Paul uses scripture to challenge people, to encourage them, to reason with them about who Jesus is and what his plan is for their life. And you and I can use scripture to, to give to people. Let me show it to you. It comes from Acts chapter 17, verses two through four. It says this, as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and he proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. And he said this, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. And then some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas. In other words, they became followers of Jesus in that moment. Why? And then it goes on and says, and along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. So here's this persuasive moment Paul has. He just uses the scripture to encourage the people. I promise all of us can do this. You can send a text message to somebody you know struggling with a scripture of hope. You could write a letter to someone, maybe a family member that lives far away with some scripture in it, with a message of hope. You could share some scripture with somebody that's going through something at work or another student or a boss. Maybe, maybe there is gonna be a little persuasive reasoning moment where somebody is, has a stronghold on their life and you're gonna show them what the word of God says. The word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It works if you work it. And so all of us can use a persuasive approach. I can't tell you how many times I've sent a text message to somebody that I know is not following Jesus, but they're going through a dark time and I send them a verse and I send them scripture and I send them some hope and I just text it over or I speak it to them or I print it out and I give it to them, whatever that is. A few times I've written letters and I've written these letters to people that, and I've given them the salvation message in the letter with the scripture showing this is how you give your life to the Lord. Now what's funny is both of those letters with boyfriends that I was breaking up with in the letter too, but it all went great. So they, we broke up and they got saved. I say praise God for that. This was a long time ago, not well, you know. And I mailed these letters and I got responses. All the, all, the, all the times that I've sent scripture to people, I've never gotten a negative response. I've always got, that was just what I needed. And it opened the door. It softened a heart. It started to present the word of God to somebody that otherwise, we think everyone knows the word. All, if you're a believer in the room, you don't know all the word. <laughs> And so we have to just know that there's a persuasive approach that we can use the word of God to encourage unbelievers. Here's another one, number three. Here's another approach. And that is Matthew's relational approach. Now we find that Matthew, he's also called Levi in scripture. He's another one of the first disciples of Jesus. And as soon as Jesus calls him to follow him, he becomes a fisher of men. And the way he does it is a relational approach. Look what happens in Luke chapter five. Verses 29 through 32, it says, later Levi held a banquet, a dinner in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with him. And, and what he's saying is he invited all of his friends that didn't know Jesus yet. 
He said, just come over for dinner. Just come sit at my table. Just come and I'm gonna invest in you. Just come have a conversation. Just come and spend some time in my home. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum, they said. And Jesus answered them this, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come not to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. In fact, Jesus is saying, I like Matthew's approach. Matthew's doing exactly what he should be doing. He's inviting lost people to come sit at his table so that he can have an encou- they can have an encounter with me too. Jesus was affirming Matthew's approach in this. And you and I can do this. We can invest in relationships. Who is it around you that does not know the Lord yet, but you could start building a relationship with? You could start investing in a relationship with. You could be led by the Holy Spirit in how to build that relationship. You could invite them to lunch. You could take them coffee. You can invite them to your home. Whatever it is, I promise God will show you the right ones. I think back to a time before I was in ministry, I was in pharmaceutical cells and I would call on doctor's offices and take pharmaceuticals to doctor's office to leave samples. And I would also tell them about the products that my company sold and that we, they made and that could be used by their patients. And so one of the things I would get to do is have lunches there. I would bring in lunch for the entire staff, the nurses, the office staff, the doctors, and I would get to sit at lunch. Now, the main reason I would do that was so that I could see the doctor and tell them about the product so that he could write that product or understand the, the, why to write that product and I could get a good bonus. That's just how it worked, right? So, but there was something about this one office that I felt compelled to this one specific nurse that I felt like God told me to invest in her, to build a relationship with her. I didn't know her. I didn't know why. And so what I began to do is I planned my lunches more frequently at that office and I would take in lunch as often as I could and I would stay later at those lunches and I wouldn't just visit with the doctors. I would stay and have a conversation with this one particular nurse. And time after time, month after month, I built this relationship with this young lady named Courtney. Now, what you need to know, what I found out about Courtney in that time is Courtney had been raised as a Jehovah's Witness, but then her family had rejected her because she married an Orthodox Jew, Jewish man. And so now she's going through a divorce. At that time, when I was meeting with her on these lunches, she was going through a divorce and now she's a single mom and she's got her family and this Jehovah Witness belief system. She's got the Orthodox Jewish belief system and she does not know anything else. And I did not feel equipped for those conversations, but I could build a relationship and I could just pour into her. And we began to do things outside of just those lunches until one day I felt brave and bold enough to invite her to a women's conference night. And I invited Courtney to come to that night and she said yes, and that surprised me. And she met me and we drove to this event and we sat in a service much like this and we sat in the seats and here's what I knew. I knew at the end of that message, that speaker was gonna give a direct approach. That speaker was gonna do an altar call and give the salvation message. I prayed for Courtney the entire service until we got to the very end. And I'll never forget what happens next. And the woman that was preaching that night, she did give a very direct altar call to have of how to give your life to Jesus. And she asked, if anybody in the room wants to give their life to Jesus tonight, I want you to lift your hand. And I will never forget feeling Courtney's hand go straight up in the air right beside me. And I began to cry and Courtney began to cry. And then she said, why don't you come to the altar? And we got up and we, I got to walk with Courtney to the altar and help lead her in a salvation prayer and her life was never the same again. Why? Because of a relational approach. You see, it doesn't just happen maybe the first time you meet with somebody. There's gonna be some investment that we have to do in the people's lives, and we can't just hang out with our church friends. They already know. They don't need you to tell them. I mean, they may need you to remind them. But they already know. Jesus said, I'm gonna leave the 99 to go find the one. I'm gonna come to seek and save the lost. I'm not coming for the healthy, I'm coming for the sick. Jesus reminds us what this looks like. And so we gotta build relationships. And when we do, God can do supernatural work like he did in Courtney's life that night. Here's the fourth one, and it's this, number four. There's Tabitha's service approach. 
The service approach is much like what we did yesterday with Serve Day. We just went to serve people. We did acts of kindness for people. We did nice things for people. We went out and we met their needs and we served them. The service, the service approach will soften hearts. I have to tell you, this is the most exciting news. You already heard at the front of the service about the young woman who came to the laundromat. She was the single mom, right? You remember that story um, that Aaron told us earlier? Well, in first service, we shared that story at the beginning and then, and then we preached the message and then we gave the altar call and there there was this young lady that sat right there in the second row. And when I gave that salvation, like I'm about to do very soon, I, she started to cry. She raised her hand. She gave her life to the Lord. And after the service, I got to walk down, hug her and tell her how proud we are and that her life will never be the same. And then I find out and she proceeds to tell me, I'm the single mom from the laundromat. Only God, we just needed to cast some line. We just needed to serve. You know, we planted some seed yesterday, but nobody directly led her. But then God knew where she needed to be, where there would be a direct approach and she would meet Jesus and her life will never be the same. And we will care for her and wrap our arms around her. A service approach. Look where we find this in Acts chapter nine. It's a great story. It's this woman named Tabitha. They also call her Dorcas, but I could not bring myself to call her that. So, you know, don't name your kid Dorcas, please. But if your name is Dorcas, we do love you and we think it's a great name. <laughs> and we're gonna call you Tabitha. <laughs> Acts chapter nine says this, verses 36 through 37. There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas, and she all, was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. She was always serving others. And about this time, she became ill and she died and her body was washed for burial and she was laid in an upstairs room. Now don't picture the, you know, she hasn't been breathing for two minutes and they've resuscitated her. That is not what this is saying. They have prepared her body for the funeral, which took a long time in that manner. They have done everything they need to have a funeral and she is now passed away clearly in, in an upper room. And, and then we get to Acts chapter nine, verse 39. And what has happened is there were a couple believers around and they heard that Peter was in the in this vicinity and they knew crazy stuff happens when Peter prays. And so we could just go get Peter and tell him about it. And so they went to get Peter while all the others that she had been serving were still grieving with her. And look, verse 39, it says, so Peter returned with them. And as soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room and the room was filled with widows who were weeping and showing him all the coats and the other clothes that Tabitha had made for them. Again, she's just serving. She's serving those in need. And then what happens is Peter sends them all out of the room and then Peter gets down on his knees and he begins to pray. And then he says, Tabitha, get up. And the Bible says, you can go read it for yourself, that her eyes pop open and she wakes up. And then look what happens, verse 41 through 42, Acts chapter nine. And so he gave her his hand and he helped her up. And then he called the widows and all the believers and he presented her to them alive. And then look what happens. Then the news spread through the whole town and many believed in the Lord. <laughs> Now you could ask yourself like, why, what was so great? Like, why did they believe in the Lord? I mean, was it because she died and then got resurrected? Well, I think that played a part. That definitely played a part, but I want you to think about it. It's because they were in the room to witness it. You see, if Tabitha was a grouchy old lady that never did anything for anybody, ain't nobody gonna be in the room. Nobody's going to see this miracle happen. Nobody's going to go get Peter. Nobody's going to be there trying to serve Tabitha and prepare her. Nobody's going to be in the room had Tabitha not been serving others. But because Tabitha was using a service approach and giving, pouring her life out for the sake of others, there's this combination moment that gets to happen where the message of Jesus, the signs of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus go forward and a whole town begins to believe because people were in the room because she had been serving others, the service approach. Here's the fifth one. It's this, number five, the Samaritan woman's invitational approach. An invitational, this is where we just, this is the come and see for yourself approach. Come and see, 
Come and see how Jesus has changed me. Come and see where I meet Jesus. Maybe this is a come see, come to church with me approach. The invitational, come to be at a service. Come and join me for a small group. Come to this event that my church is holding. Anywhere that you know that there's gonna be a good news gospel something, that that's that invitational approach. Come and see for yourself. And this happened with the Samaritan woman in John chapter four. And what's happening in John chapter four, the Bible tells us there was a Samaritan woman, a woman from Samaria at the well in the middle of the day and she's drawing water and Jesus shows up on the scene. So now it's just her and Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus begins to tell this woman everything she's ever done. And she is amazed. There's no way he can know all this about me, the Bible says. And then I want you to watch what happens. Basically, the Bible says she has an encounter with him and he explains to her, the water that you're looking for is me. I am I am the living water. If you'll take a drink of me and you'll have an encounter with me, you will never thirst again. And so she has a life-changing encounter with Jesus at the well. And look what she immediately does. John chapter four, verses 28 through 30, it says, the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see for yourself. A man who told me everything I did could he possibly be the Messiah? And so the people came streaming from the village to see him. And many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. Now, let me make something clear. It wasn't because he told her everything she'd ever done, like all of her sin, all of her, all of her closet material. That wasn't it. It's, here's what she's saying. He knew everything I've ever done and he still loved me and he still invited me, and he still rescued me, he still saved me. He didn't care, he knew all my secrets, and he still loved me. That's what she's telling the people. He knew it all, and he still came just for me. And then we get to verses 39 through 42, because now the village has come out and it says, when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. And so he stayed for two days long enough to hear his message and believe. And they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we've heard him for ourselves. And we indeed know he is the savior of the world. The invitational approach. Come to the place where I encountered Jesus and he's changed my life. All of us can do an invitational approach. We can invite somebody to church. We can invite somebody to a small group. We can send them a message online, just thinking about you. And I feel like this is a word from God for your life. It's that invite, come and see for yourself what God is doing in me. Nobody can debate that. Just if somebody is trying to debate you, why do you go to church? Why do you do this? Why do you do? Come see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Come see for yourself. The invitational approach. I want to share this verse with you because I want you to see before I go on, we've got two more and we're done. All these approaches are usually working together. Usually it's gonna take multiple approaches for somebody to actually say yes to Jesus. Not every time, but many times. In fact, I'll show it to you. First Corinthians chapter three, verses six through seven. It says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God made it grow. In other words, I might do an approach that plants some seed. Someone else might do an approach that gives it water. And eventually they may come into this place and God makes it grow. And God draws their heart to Jesus. It matters that all of us are doing our part in just sowing seed and watering it. it, it might, they may not say yes to Jesus in that moment and you should not be discouraged. Here's what you know. Good seed was planted today that scripture that I sent them, that invite that I gave them, that time that I served them. It's all seed planted. Someone else can water it too. And then God's gonna make it grow. And so here's the sixth approach. It's this, number six, Philip's supernatural approach. The supernatural approach. This is an approach where we believe that God does miracles. And, and there are times that when people that do not follow Jesus, but how do many of you know, they still need a miracle. They're sick and they need healed. There's, a, there's something going on in their family that seems impossible. They've lost a job. There's this moment where they need a miracle. And all throughout scripture, God would use 
people to pray for miracles for people and that would result in them coming to salvation. It was the miracle that they saw that caused them to believe in Jesus. And that's exactly what happens with Philip. Let me show it to you. Acts chapter eight, verses four through eight says this. Those have been scattered to preach the word wherever they went. And Philip went down in the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all played, paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and impure spirits came out and many who were paralyzed or lame, they were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. I loved it. It says, they believed what he said because of what they saw. Can I just challenge us, church, and encourage us? The instruction of Jesus was, go out into the world, heal the sick, cast out demons, free the captives. We have a responsibility that when we go out, we take the supernatural power of God with us. And there's probably people in your world that need a miracle working prayer prayed over them. Don't be too scared to lay hands on people and pray for them. There's been so many times I've just felt compelled with strangers and I've just asked them in airports or Walmart or wherever it is, and not all of us are comfortable with this. And I was uncomfortable at the time, but I would ask them, I feel like God wants me to pray for you. Is there something that I could pray for you today? And it never failed. It was a miracle they needed. And I was able to pray over them and I may never see them again, but I would always tell them when God answers this prayer, because God will touch you because we've asked heaven to touch you today. When he does, I want you to fully give your life to him. Don't forget that it was God that met you here today, sent me to pray for you and answered your prayer. And we can attach this supernatural approach, but we can't if we don't pray. I, I mean, the only way you're gonna get a miracle and I'm gonna see a miracle is if we pray for it. If we know that it's needed, we lay hands on, we give glory to God, we call down heaven and we see that thing happen. Philip's supernatural approach, we're equipped for it, church. Let me give you the last one. The final one's this, number seven, and that is the blind man's testimonial approach. Your testimony, that's all. It's just your story. How did you meet Jesus? How did he change your life? How are you different now? It's just, it's just your story. Here's the thing, nobody can argue with your story. N nobody can be offended by your story. It's just your testimony. And this comes from a man that was blind in scripture in John chapter nine. In verse, what happens is he has an encounter with Jesus. He's a blind beggar. Jesus shows up on the scene. Jesus makes some mud, lays hands on his eyes. He can now see, and he's a totally different man. He wasn't just physically blind, he was spiritually blind, and now both have been awakened. He's had an encounter with Jesus. And look, verses eight through 11, it says this, his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it was, and others said, no, they just look alike. I wonder if anybody else in the room, you've ever been so changed that your friends did not believe it. <laughs> like, no, 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 I know them before. This must just be a look alike. This must not be real. And that's happening for this blind man. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, well, then who healed you? What happened? And he told them his story. He said, the man they called Jesus, he made mud and he spread it over my eyes. And he told me, go to the pool and wash yourself. And so I went and I washed and now I can see. And they still didn't believe him and they still argued with it. The religious leaders, they were mad about it because they didn't like Jesus. They call in his parents. They're trying to get any more information. And then it says this in verses 24 through 27, John chapter nine. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus is a sinner. Here's how the man says it. I don't know, if, I don't know whether he's a sinner. He's going, I don't know the scriptures. I don't know theology. I don't know why God does what God does. I don't know that. And I don't have to know that because I know this. I was blind and now I can see. I was lost and now I'm found. I was broken and now I'm mended. I was that way and now I'm this way. I don't know, I can't answer your questions, but I know this, I was blind and now I see. I am a completely different person and I've had an encounter with the Messiah and I am changed forever. 
and they kept going, but what did he do? They asked, and how did he heal you? And then the man said, I've already told you once. Didn't you listen? Do you want me to tell you again? He's like, I'll tell you my story as many times as you'll listen to it. And then he says something funny. He said, do you wanna become disciples too? I mean, the guy's already fishing. He's like, this is my story. Here's my testimony. Nobody can argue with your testimony. Here's what you're doing. You're sharing the love of God through your personal story. I wanna ask you, who have you told your story to? Because I know a lot of you. And there are some stories in this room that deserve to be told. In fact, all of them. (laughs) But we're responsible for telling it. How will they know if they don't hear? And how will they hear if we don't tell them? Just use your story to tell somebody else about the love of God. Let me give you this last verse and we'll close. First Peter chapter two, verses nine through 10. But you, God says to us, are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do His work and to speak out for Him to tell others of the night and day difference He made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fishers of men. And if I'm not fishing, am I really following Jesus? Because followers fish. I wanna give you one more tool because now you know, you've seen all these different approaches in scripture. It's not one size fits all, but there is a size for you. We know all the reasons that may stop you this week. And now you know what to do with them because you have scripture for them. You know all the different choices of approaches to take for fishing this week for sharing your faith with somebody else. And I wanna give you one more tool and just equip you as a reminder this week because I wanna keep going what we started yesterday. The harvest field is ripe, Jesus said. He's, He's saying the fish are biting. Just go on and cast your line. And so I want you as on your way out today, when you leave, the ushers are gonna give you an invite card. It's just, it's just an invite card to church. It's just a reminder. You can use it if you want this week. Either way, I want it to remind you and ask yourself, who could I use one of these approaches with this week to do something for that shares the love of God? And now it has the invite to church. You can use this. Maybe you're gonna pay for somebody behind you in the McDonald's line. And you're gonna give this to the clerk and say, just give this to them and tell them God loves them. And they're, they're, that's gonna happen to them. Or maybe you're gonna write a card or send a text or, or you're gonna hand this to somebody when you pay for their groceries. I don't know, let God show you. There's all these approaches, but whatever you do, make sure this week I'm asking that you would join me in going fishing and watch what God's gonna do, amen? Would you pray with me? In just a minute, I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to empower us to be fishers of men for those following Jesus. But before that, I wanna speak to those of you in the room that are not following Jesus. You've never given your life to Jesus. You've never surrendered or you didn't even know that was an option. And the truth is heaven and hell are real. And God's plan is not for His children that He's created to go to hell. He has a plan. And all it is, is that we confess with our mouths that Jesus is the Lord and surrender our lives to Him. And the grace of Jesus will fall on us and we will spend eternity with Him. And that is available to you today. And so if you're in the room and you've never given your life to Jesus, but you feel the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart today, or maybe you were at one point, but you've, you've been so far gone, you've, you've lived a different life and you're ready to rededicate your life to Jesus today. Would you just lift your hand right where you are? I'm not asking you to come up or anything. You're just gonna pray a prayer. I see hands, I see hands, I see hands. You're just gonna pray a prayer right where you are. I want you to pray this in your heart. Today, Jesus, I give you my life. I repent of my sin and I ask you to come into my heart. I surrender everything I am to you today. I ask that you would fill me with your spirit and show me how to live 
in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' name. You can put your hands down, we're so proud of you. Best decision ever. And now the rest of us in the room, we want God to empower us to be fishers of men. And so would you lift your hands towards heaven if you just are asking God, make me a fisher of men, show me, fill me, give me the wisdom I need. And so Father, here we are, your sons and your daughters, your followers, Jesus, and we ask, Holy Spirit, fill us fresh. Give us the boldness we need. Give us the wisdom we need. Give us divine encounters this week. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Jesus, with the compassion that lived on the inside of you, would you place it on the inside of us? Remind us to serve others, to share our testimony this week, to give an invite, maybe to give a direct message. God, we just wanna obey you this week and we wanna see that people that do not know you come to faith in you, Jesus. And so we surrender this week to you. Walk with us and show us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise today.